Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Tip of the Iceberg podcast, brought to you as always by InsideThePenguins.com, a proud affiliate of the Hockey News. I'm your host, Nick Berlansky, joined as always by Nick Horwat, and here we are in day three of the Penguins' four-day break between their two games against Anaheim this past Monday, where they lost 4-3. to three. We talked about that back on Tuesday's episode, so if you didn't catch that, go back and listen to it. And their next game, which is Saturday night at 10 p.m. against the San Jose Sharks out at the SAP Center, one of the five buildings the Pittsburgh Penguins have clinched the Stanley Cup in. So Horwat will get to that matchup in a little bit. But before we do that, there's been a lot of talk about you know what the Penguins can do to try to change their fortunes, because as of right now, they're 3-6-0. and They're in dead last place in the Eastern Conference heading into the month of November, and they need to turn things around because even though it's a long season, even though, as Sidney Crosby said in the locker room at practice a couple days ago, there's a lot of hockey left to be played. It can get late really early with a league that has as many good teams, especially in the Eastern Conference, as there is. So what we're going to do here today, we're going to talk a little bit about lineup changes. We're going to talk a little bit about Saturday's matchup against the Sharks, and then we're going to talk a little bit about some of the biggest surprises that we saw in the first month of the season. Let's start with one change for what, and Mm -hmm. I want to hear our listeners' opinion on this, so let us know in the comment section what you think that one change should be in the Penguins lineup to try to turn things around. Just one. Where are you going with this one? Just one. Just one. Make it a softball, why don't you? Uh, Jeff (laughs) Carter needs to find his way to the press box. Mm-hmm. and not that that solves all of the problems and not that he he's even arguably been the worst player on this team. I just feel like that kind of move would refresh a lot of things both on the ice and off the ice for that matter. Like I said, Jeff Carter hasn't been, hasn't felt like the worst player. He's gotten a couple of chances here and there. Like I said, he had that interesting break of speed at one point in, uh, in the last game. Um, It'll kind, of, but it would kind of change with the mojo. You realize a veteran is getting uh, canned, basically. That's it's one of that's one of those wake up call moves. It would refresh something in the locker room. Maybe it wakes up a wakes up a voice. Maybe it whoever whoever gets put in that lineup gets that opportunity to do something. Um, and also because of who it is, it is this and last season's uh, whipping boy. The fan base gets behind you a little more. <laughs> the fan base gains that intrigue of oh, you finally did the thing we've been begging for since. Uh, he signed his extension. Um, I think that that one move could do a lot. Again, it's probably not going to happen, but that is just the first one that comes to mind. Arguably, there are other players in this lineup that could be swapped out and probably have a better return for the team as a whole. Uh, something about Jeff Carter just hasn't felt like he's been the worst. I mean, that whole line is kind of bleeding together of what have you done because it's nothing. They haven't been getting scored against, and that's good, but you also haven't banged home any of those depth points that we were really hoping for. So I like the idea of uh, Jeff Carter being the odd man out in that situation, um, but also because maybe the team needs an injection of youth, although we've been asking for that for how many years? That's not coming. <laughs> uh, but, you know, that's that, that's that if I just had to pick the one, I would say starting there. Uh, there mm-hmm. are plenty of other issues, though. Yeah, you look at this lineup, and one thing that I've I've noticed through nine games, and again, it's only nine games, so how much change can you expect through that amount of time? But the one thing we were almost promised by Kyle Dubas is he wasn't going to let people get comfortable. He wasn't going to let going to let players get comfortable because once you get comfortable, especially for a team that's not top of the league like the Pittsburgh Penguins expected to be this season, nobody expected them to be the the best team in the Metropolitan Division. They were expected to be a team that was going to battle for a playoff position. And if you're in that position, you can't get comfortable, especially when you're not playing proper hockey. Because if you don't think that somebody is going to supplant you in the lineup, then what do you? What motivation do you have to go out there and to perform better? So a little bit of comfort, I think, is settled in in this Pittsburgh Penguins lineup. You saw earlier this season, and again, earlier this season, we're only nine games in, but we saw earlier this season that there is at least one example of what happens when you change one factor on a line how it can change the entire outlook for the entire line and everybody knows who i'm talking about because it's the only real i mean i guess you could go to the defense and say ryan shape or po joseph has been a pretty permanent change to this point but you know one simple swap did wonders for the pittsburgh penguins third line you look at zahorna going in for jansen harkins 
four games into the season with Harkins, that line and four games played had 42% of the shot attempts at five on five, 35% of the expected goals. And they hadn't scored one of their own. They gave up only one. And like you mentioned, it's sort of like this fourth line. They were playing good defensively. They weren't giving up a lot of goals, but they weren't creating chances. They weren't creating high quality chances and they weren't contributing at all to the scoreboard. Now with Zahorna, we're five games in. So a similar sample size here, 66% of the shot attempts, that's a 24% bump, 71% of the expected goals, that's a 36% bump, and they're three to one in the goal scoring category in those games since. And you could just tell, I test wise, like I gave you the underlying stats there. I test wise, they have been so much better with Redeem Zahorna on the ice with Eller and Drew O'Connor. So one small change completely changed the, the aspect and the outlook of the third line. I agree with you. Do that for the fourth line. See if it changes. And now I understand it's unlikely to happen, but you have Vinny Henestroza sitting in the in the press box right now. He impressed some people during training camp. Give him an opportunity and see what that speed does because then you have Nieto and Henestroza on the sides and on the wings, and those two guys provide a lot of speed. What does that change by way of the fourth line, seeing him out there instead of Jeff Carter? Exactly. It's just that extra boost of, Maybe something new. And again, this doesn't have to be a permanent move because no. we know how much uh, Mike Sullivan really loves Jeff Carter in the lineup and continues to speak highly of him. Uh, but it's just one of those things that we need something to get this team into gear. The, the, Pe- the Penguins need that wake-up call. It's Something's got to give. I don't know what it could be. Because they'll continue to stand by that you know the scores and their record haven't reflected necessarily how they've played for most of the season and you know what if you look at certain things you can you can understand that yeah um but overall at the end of the day the record does speak for itself there is something wrong with what's going on maybe it is just finishing maybe it is just the timely goaltending regardless something's got to give and something needs to be you know that wake-up call needs to arrive whether it's from a certain scratch, maybe Kyle Dubas needs to get on the horn with some teams here. It's I know it's only November second, but um, sometimes as a as a new front office face too, um, you have to state you know stake your claim to this team, make your presence felt. He did that <laughs> in the off season, that's for sure. Yeah, but one of those big mid season trades of wake up and do something. I mean, P.O. Joseph hasn't been in the lineup in how long, and Ryan Shea doesn't look to be coming out anytime soon. There's a name. See, Ah. here's the thing with that, though, because Mm -hmm. if something happens to Ryan Shea, then where are you at? Right? You got Ty Smith in the minors waiting waiting around if you really need it. Yeah, Uh, but Ty Smith is. I don't know, man. And Mark Mark Pissick's on the other side. I'm I'm just kind of naming names here because Mark Pissick's working his way back. You You did bring in Jack Rathbone. That's another option. Like you have, like, Maybe. and that is, and that falls more in the line of a Kyle Dubas guy rather than someone who's brought in under the Hextall regime, right? right? So there, mm-hmm. there are the options there. If you're right, because injuries do happen, um, but somehow that defensive surplus has dwindled, but it's still kind of there. That where you have the options. Let's say if one of your guys goes down, well, you've got names. You got, yeah. You know, like I said, you have Ty Smith there if you really want to put him in despite some of the things that have been said about him, uh, he's still an option, still a viable NHL option. There mm-hmm. is Jack Rathbone that you brought in and is likely more your guy than some of these other names. Same goes for Mark Pissick. If he comes back soon enough and signs a contract, by the way, that does still need to happen. Yeah. Oh, I just kind of threw that name out there because he's been skating and has had a stall this entire time. Will Butcher is still around, I think. <laughs> he's, he's suddenly disappeared from practices, but... That's also still an option. So you have the names there. You know, I don't think we're worried about if a trade piece goes out, who do we have left? Plenty. We still have plenty, it seems. Yeah, you have names there. I, I just think high-end options. I don't think Ty Smith. I, I think there's a reason that you've seen him just fall more and more down the depth chart. And, you know, it's not just that he's falling down the depth chart. It's that Kyle Dubas has actively brought players in to go above mm-hmm. him in the depth chart. So I don't know if I would consider Ty Smith a top tier option at this point, just simply because, you know, he he's been replaced. He's been supplanted on the depth chart and he hasn't really had that great of a season at the AHL level to start the year, at least from what I've seen. But, you know, when it comes to that trade and we'll get to I have one lineup change as well. We'll do that really quickly. I've already mentioned it on the podcast a couple of days ago if you were paying attention, but 
if it comes to trading P.O. Joseph, what is the purpose of that? Like, is it just to open up a roster spot? Is it to just get some draft capital for next season's draft? Like, you're not going to bring in a player for P.O. Joseph. So what is the next move after that, I think? It, it, trading P.O. Joseph just to trade P.O. Joseph, just to send a guy out of the locker room, doesn't make ses- sense unless you have another move lined up. And what are you addressing with that? Because right now, we already talked about in this lineup, there's not really a spot on the forward side, right? You're not going to change the third line. It's been as good as it's been over the past couple of seasons. And the top six is the top six. You're not changing that either. And you look at the fourth line, you have a three-year contract in Chari, a two-year contract in, in uh, Matt Nieto, and you have Jeff Carter, who we've talked about as the immovable object. So there's not really space there yeah. to think that trading a guy that's been a healthy scratch for the past five games is really going to make any material difference to the NHL roster. That's why I'm simply saying, what is the point of trading a guy like P.O. Joseph? While you do have options, Rathbone, you mentioned them, great. They're all unproven options, whereas Joseph, you at least have an idea of what he would bring for you at the NHL level. You're, you're right, but you also have to consider what he's done this year, and it is not great things. The, In four no games. Is, you're, In four yeah, games. But, and maybe that's part of Kyle Dubas and Mike Sullivan keeping people uncomfortable this year. I think we had that discussion yeah. when that happened. It was... We're seeing quick changes here. If you can't get it done in the immediate, uh, that's enough of it. We're going to pull the plug. We're going to try something else. I mean, that worked. That, not that it works, but we saw that with P.O. Joseph and uh, Chad Ruedel for a minute, uh, and mm-hmm. then they didn't. Then we really haven't seen it anywhere else. Uh, and that kind of deal, I think, at least in my head, because he is a still a 24 year old yeah. defensive uh, defenseman, just a 24 year old defenseman that's a young gun that, you know, a couple of years ago, we would have said could be a leader on this defensive core. I'm sure the rest of the team kind of saw it that way as well, especially some of the guys that might be here for a couple of years, i.e. those dudes that signed the six year deals under Hextall, Rust, Raquel, you could say Latang for a minute. Um, they're all kind of expecting P.O. Joseph to be here for a little bit, right? We, they, mm-hmm. everyone's kind of put this high praise on them and then, Hey, you guys aren't performing. You'll lose one of those guys. Poof. Uh, it, maybe it is for nothing. Yeah. Maybe it is just for draft capital and cap space. Um, and you and just maybe uh, for someone else to get a chance. Remember, John Ludwig is still around. I mean, yeah, concussion protocol, but it's not like he's on IR or anything. Not that, that yeah. not also not that that means anything. But once he's good to go, he's good to go right back into the lineup. Can easily yeah. slot in for P.O. Joseph. The names are there again. This isn't supposed to be a top end high end headline grabbing marquee trade this is just more yeah. of the the penguins need a wake up call deal well, let's get something yeah. going for in Kyle Dubas' eyes this isn't a player that uh i brought in this isn't a player that i've been impressed with and mm-hmm. we need the jump start poof that's just the way the business works mm-hmm. Pio joseph is a locker room guy too send off a he locker is. room guy who that yeah. lights an anger you want to do something about it Everyone in that room also does understand it's a business. Now, mm-hmm. This isn't trying to lose the room, but it's something to say, okay, let's find our finishing ability. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now, here's the thing. The last time that I can think of, just off the top of my head, when you say, oh, you're trading a locker room guy to wake up the locker room, I think of Carl Hagelin. And it went downhill after the Penguins traded Carl Hagelin to the LA Kings. Uh, I, I seem to remember that. Uh, did not did not actually have the intended purpose that it did. And, and you know what? With P.O. Joseph, I don't think you're getting much in return, but hey, maybe a maybe a, a new guy on the job like Steve Steos up there in Ottawa. You look at all the defensive Ooh. injuries that Ottawa's facing. You see Matthew up there, his nope. brother. You know, if you're willing to part with the second round pick, which is ridiculous, this is that's very very much a ridiculous ask for P.O. Joseph. But if you're willing to part with a second round pick, I'm not going to say no if I'm Kyle Dubas. But again, it's probably more so. Hey, you could get maybe a fourth round pick, maybe a fifth round pick in exchange, maybe a pick swap third for fourth. Um, But at the end of the day, I just I don't see at this point in time, especially with John Ludwig injured and with, you know, Mark Pesek, as you mentioned, they have high, high expectations for Mark Pesek once he gets healthy. And if he signs the contract, they liked him coming into camp. So Mm -hmm. maybe that becomes an option. But as of right now, he's still on the shelf. So with the next man up after P.O. Joseph being. Is it Jack Rathbone? Is it Ty Smith? I, I probably w- would at least hold off 
at this point. And I also don't want to give up on a 24 year old defenseman because he had four bad games to start the season, because let's remember he was also pretty good last season, his first full year. So while yes, Ryan Shea has been good and, and we'll talk about him a little bit later. And yes, John Ludwig looked good in his five minutes and 23 seconds of ice time. I'm not really willing to make that move yet. Um, unless, unless you're really confident in what you have behind him, unless you really like Jack Rathbone, but I just personally haven't seen it obviously. Cause I haven't really watched him all that much considering he's only played a handful of games for Wilkes-Barre. Just a handful played a handful of games in the NHL too, with the Canucks. Uh, we'll see what he can bring. I mean, it's like, like I mentioned, that's going to be a, that's going to be one of the players that we look at as a Dubas guy. And it's, cause mm-hmm. that is, really how you have to decipher some of the things that um, some of these early moves that Kyle has made when it comes to sending people out, uh, you're trying to cleanse yourself of the Hextall era pretty much. And that might still be going on in certain areas. Uh, I'd say Mark Friedman was definitely an example of that. Yeah. Uh, And Rathbone's going to be his guy. So we'll see where things go from there. I just figure P.O. Joseph seems like the most likely option at this point because those forwards you can't really move around. They're sort of not necessarily set in stone, but the forward changes you're making are most likely going to be in-house unless you want to pull the plug on a rather large name, but that'll be hard to do with some clauses in, for yeah. everybody. Yeah. Yeah, they're handing out clauses like nobody's business yeah. are the Pittsburgh Penguins. And that that's Kyle Dubas, too. It's not all, you know, Ron Hextall right. has some... Ron Hextall has some bad clauses in there. Let's not forget he gave Raquel, Rust, and Jeff Carter all all clauses when they signed their contract. Not to mention, obviously, you know, Chris Letang and Evgeny Malkin, but those were expected. But we're supposed to, yep. Yeah, I mean, Tristan Jari got one this summer. Did, does you're looking at the cap friendly? Yeah. Does uh does Nolachari have a clause on his contract? Yes, he does. Of course, he does. Three right. years modified. Oh my lord! Oh, Eight my team, lord. so it's not like it's huge, but yeah, but still, you're handcuffing yourself a little bit when you probably don't have to. I get it, he's a veteran player, and that's something veteran players have been asking for a little bit more often, especially since uh, the COVID shutdown and the uncertainty surrounding contracts. I mean, there's still free agents that are pretty good players right now that are not playing in the league. Look at Phil Kessel. Look at uh, Patrick Kane. Doesn't have a contract right now. Uh, Jonathan Taves has taken a gap year or something like that. I don't know. Uh, He he said he might come back after this year. I'm not exactly sure, but uh, we're going to take a quick break. Uh, My lineup change. We got a little off topic, but you know what? I thought that was a good discussion on P.O. Joseph and the Bears trading him. Um, My lineup change. I talked about on Monday's episode of Iceberg to go. Just switch Raquel and Rust already. Like you cannot keep having Ricard Raquel flounder on the second line because clearly there's something off there with his chemistry with the other two and Evgeny Malkin and Riley Smith. But I, I, I go more into more detail on that on Monday's episode. Uh, so go back and check that out if you're interested in learning more about that. But we're going to take a quick break. When we return, the Penguins are heading to their first actual road trip of the season. We'll talk about the first game of that three-game roadie after this. Welcome back to the Tip of the Iceberg podcast, brought to you as always by InsideThePenguins.com. The Pens, they've played a few road games this season, but this is their first true road trip because, you know, they went down for a quick day trip to Washington. They went for a quick day trip to Detroit. They went for a quick day trip to St. Louis because they came back in between the Detroit and St. Louis games. Now they actually get on the road. Now they actually get out of their comfort zone, get away from their families and are just with the team for the next week or so as they head out to take on the San Jose Sharks, the Anaheim Ducks, and the LA Kings in California, just in time, too, because winter weather is starting to hit western Pennsylvania real hard. I saw it was snowing up there uh, yesterday, so they're getting out of town just in time, Horwat, but first road trip of the season starts with a pretty marquee matchup, I would say. You know, the 3-6-0 Pittsburgh Penguins against the 0-8-1 San Jose Sharks. If there was not the actual storyline of this is Eric Carlson's return to San Jose, nobody in the hockey world would give an entire damn about this game. But here we are. It is a marquee matchup on Saturday night. Penguins, Sharks, first 10 o'clock start of the of the um, 
of the season. So we'll see what, what that looks like as far as our workflow for covering the game. But what have you thought about Eric Carlson? Because he's going to be the name to watch on Saturday night. Oh, he will be. And uh, everyone will continue to speak highly of Eric Carlson, even if his uh, scoring isn't necessarily quote unquote where it should be. He's looked good. He's looked fine. He's looked like Eric Carlson. Um, the, 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 it's hard to say anything bad about him yet. Maybe just that, you know, he hasn't scored at the pace we were all expecting. What do you mean at the pace we were all expecting? He's a defenseman. Let's start there. He's playing in a different role with the Penguins. We all knew he wasn't getting a hundred points. I think we all said, I think we all kind of agreed at what would we be happy with 70 to 80. You know what that, you know what that is more than uh, Crystal Tang has ever posed in his career. So we'll take 70 to 80, right? Yeah, There's... I'll take 70 to 80, but he's also on pace for 55. Thank you for doing the pace. I wasn't sure on that. We're all expecting that to wake up too, though, right? Yeah. That's part <laughs> yeah. of that's part of the you know, part of the season here. We're all expecting all these guys to sort of kick kick it up a notch as you know mm-hmm. the season progresses. Like they keep saying, they're gonna stick to their game because they are outplaying in certain areas. Moving on from that, though, Eric Carlson's looked good. He's looked solid offensively for the most part, defensively, definitely. And if he can continue making plays, making unreal passes, and he, as long as he doesn't lose his hockey vision, you know, he's going to be a good player for this team. And maybe things wake up in San Jose. Good old tribute video. Good old maybe a, a smattering of playful booze because that wasn't a great relationship toward the end. Um, but certainly... Uh, not not a bad taste in the mouth uh, for Eric Carlson and San Jose. It'll be a fun game to watch. Yeah, he pulled the old Denny Lemieux from Slapshot. Trade me right effing now. And uh, they did. And luckily for the Pittsburgh Penguins, they traded him to the, to the Pens. But when I don't I know if it his... was right now that they traded him, but, you know, yeah, it was, no, but they got to it, it eventually. Was, yeah, he was one of the players that was saying, hey, I want traded before the season. I actually got traded. I mean, sorry for John Gibson, who stayed with the Ducks, and now he's injured. But, you know, at the same time, uh, you look at his performance through the first nine games, and like you mentioned, the point scoring is down a little bit more, and it's not just the overall points. I think there's something to he really just hasn't gotten on the same wavelength with some of the Penguins forwards to this point, and that's fair because Carlson is a very, very unique defenseman in the way that he plays the game. He's unique when it comes to being in the offensive zone as well. Some of the passes that he makes are passes that only he can make, and we've seen that at points throughout the season. But I think it goes back to something he said when he was talking about the power play. He said, somebody just needs to take charge. Mm -hmm. Well, Eric, you're the highest paid player on the team. Eventually, you need to just look in the mirror and say, I need to take charge. Now, I understand you're playing with Sidney Crosby, who is the face of a generation. You're playing with Evgeny Malkin, who is one of the greatest Russian-born players in the history of the National Hockey League. You're playing with Chris Letang, who is playing better than he has played in years. I get that, and it's a team game, and I understand that. But he has to understand, there's a reason he gets paid the money that he does. There's a reason that everybody made such a big deal when he got traded to the Penguins. It's because he has immense talent, and he needs to be the one to take charge, and I think that that's what I haven't seen this season, is him take charge. I've seen him start to become a cog in the operation, which is good. You want to be a team player, that's fine. But let's not act like the operation hasn't been a little flawed under Mike Sullivan here the last couple of years. So get out, be yourself, and take charge of the game. I want to see that a little bit more often from Eric Carlson. Yeah, the whole take charge thing, I agree with you that someone does need to do it, and it maybe should be him because of A, the paycheck, and B, the ability that we know he can bring. Mm -hmm. Um, There is an interesting dichotomy, though, when it comes to someone taking charge on uh, the power play specifically, because if you look at the players that are out there, there's Crosby, Malkin, uh, we'll just focus on the three. Crosby, Malkin, and Carlson on the top unit. Uh, when it comes to taking charge for Sidney Crosby or Evgeny Malkin, or start with Carlson, sorry. When it comes to Carlson taking charge, well, he's looking at those two and going, well, they've been here. They, you know, it's their team. They've kind of designed this power place, you know, with Todd Reardon, sort of designed it. Let them take charge because it is their thing. He's He might feel like the outsider kind of coming in and doing his helpful job, not taking it over. Whereas... But Malkin and Crosby might look at Carlson coming in as, look at this resume, look at what he can do, look at how they are not necessarily canning, but demoting Chris Letang, or their former 
charge leader on that. Look at how they're taking him off of the top unit. And we're now, those two are now expecting him, Eric Carlson, to take charge. So everyone's kind of expecting everyone else to take charge. That's sort of what um, many believe has been going on to start this year with the power play. Everyone's mm-hmm. sort of waiting for everyone else to do it. No one wants to step up. Someone needs to be the first one to go, okay, I'll do it. <laughs> and that's kind of what the weight is. Hey, hey, for what it's worth, you picked up a couple of goals against the Ducks. Then that one happened against. We don't talk about it. Someone eventually will, uh, you think, find the find the leadership aspect, find the role because they're gonna. It seems like they might not filter through, but continue to change the Riley Smith position until someone fits. You know, Jake or uh, not Jake Ensel, sorry, uh, Ricard Raquel, Riley Smith, Brian Russ have all gotten time up there. Yeah, Bro redeems the horn up there if you're gonna use him as net front. I mean, there's options, but we'll see where it yeah. goes. Someone just needs to take charge, and they have to decide who. We talked on Tuesday about the net front thing. We don't need to get back into it about the fact that they really don't have a net front presence because nobody knows how to play in front of the net on this team. But yep. when it comes to, you know, who on the power play is going to take charge? Is it you? You know, you guys have been here for a while. Don't say that. It, like yeah. if you're Eric Carlson and that's the like, that's probably not the reason I, I would I would I would be 95 percent sure he's not taking charge of the power play because, well, these guys have been here before, because if that's the case, then somebody needs to get a sports psychologist in there and make him rewatch all of his highlights and be like, hey, you're a damn good player. Let's not you know, default to other players simply because they've been here longer. But the general sense of the word there, you mentioned, hey, they're just going to switch who's on that left flank until something works. If the left flank keeps changing and the same issues persist, maybe it's not the left flank that's the reason that this power play isn't succeeding. Maybe it's because the other four guys aren't doing their jobs well enough. And Eric Carlson, you know, they they do all the switching, they do all the, the rotating on the power play, and that's great. You need puck movement, you need player movement away from the puck because that's the only way that you're going to confuse penalty kills and the only way that you're going to get them out of their system. I understand that. But at the end of the day, there is a power play quarterback. Mm-hmm. And the person in that position right now is Eric Carlson. I don't care who's on the right flank. I don't care who's down low. You are the quarterback of the power play. Act like it. Take Mm -hmm. charge. And I think he needs to do that five on five as well. That's why I brought it up in the first place. But especially on the power play, I mean, you scored 101 points last year. No, not nobody's expecting you to go out there and repeat that. That's the first time that happened in 30 years. But we're expecting you to play like a player that has the capability to do that. We're expecting you to have the moxie, have the confidence that you can go out there and do that. And that is what I haven't seen. Have I seen immense talent in nine games yes have i seen ridiculous passes that i haven't seen from any other player since i don't know i wasn't i wasn't old enough to remember watching paul coffee with the pittsburgh penguins so probably since paul coffee so yeah. it, you have to be that player you cannot shy away from it now here's the thing it's not like his defense is you keep saying it's it's better and i will admit it's better than i expected it's better than yeah. the 1% that's on his j fresh hockey card in the defense but he's not going to win a defensive award there's no defensive defenseman no. award there should be he's not going to win that but you know what he does have he has a defenseman that's playing his butt off in marcus petterson yeah you know we would have talked about what's the most impressive things through october marcus petterson has been impressive and in mm-hmm. Making up for Eric Carlson when he does go up, and that's something that I think I, you're going to see more from Ryan Graves as he gets comfortable with it, with Chris Letang. But that chemistry between Carlson and Pedersen was great from game one. So you have that that safety blanket of a really good defensive defenseman. I need to see him take charge. I need to see him. You know, I understand he takes a lot of risks. I need to see him take a little bit more when it comes to getting more opportunistic and scoring more goals because I just it's been good but it should be great. And that's where I'm at. You're, and you're totally right. You're right. It's been good. Just does need to be better. needs to find that next gear. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I think that could, and that's, that's just a situation that could still go for everyone on this team. Right. Yeah. <clears throat> I think Mike Sullivan said it uh, about, uh, about Tristan Jari when it comes to how their seasons have looked. It, Tristan Jari's looked a lot like the team has. Some nights are good. Some nights are bad. Uh, as for, you know, Carlson specifically, you're right. It's just finding that extra gear, finding that extra level um, would be huge. It could be a, a big push in the right direction. Uh, something, Scott, just got to wake up soon. I don't know how yeah. else to put it. This, <laughs> I can't wait for these 1030 starts, by the way. 
yeah, I just keep looking at my calendar and cringing. Yeah. Yeah. They're uh, just, you know, as a, as a heads up to everybody that enjoys the iceberg recaps, I've enjoyed doing them. We're not doing them at one in the morning. It's not going, not going to be live at one in the morning, just to, just to let you know for the next week or so. But, um, you know, maybe Saturday is when Eric Carlson really starts to kick into the next gear. We all know that a game like this against your former team, a homecoming of sorts, that can always light and ignite something in these players. Penguins take on the San Jose Sharks, who are 0-8-1 this season. Not only are they 0-8-1 and, and the worst team in the National Hockey League, they've lost by multiple goals in all eight of their regulation losses. Their only one goal game was that shootout loss to the Colorado Avalanche. I believe it was 2-1. to one. So if there ever was a time, the league is very, very even, more even than it's been in years. I understand that. There's a lot of parity. But if there ever was a team and there ever was a time to get right, it is Saturday night against the San Jose Sharks who have one standing point on the season. Really also not fun that, uh, what's it called? Penguins aren't, haven't, uh, haven't been historically good recently out West. No, these California road trips have not been kind to the Pittsburgh Penguins. So maybe you turn that around and we also, who knows, because, you know, something is arbitrary and that actually has no effect on human life as the change of the calendar when it comes from month to month. <laughs> oh, you know, October's over. Now it's November. Realistically, what does that change? Not very much, but we've seen that, hey, new month, fresh start, that can just jumpstart a team sometimes. Maybe that helps the Pittsburgh Penguins, and they have a really good November, as we've seen in a, the past couple seasons. They've been really good in November and in December, specifically in December, they've been very, really good. So maybe we see them turn things around here um, with their first game in November with this three-game roadie and against that I don't want to say pitiful because if I say pitiful San Jose Sharks, they're probably going to go out there and beat the Penguins. But with the San Jose Sharks team that is struggling more so than the Penguins have. Hey, both of them are in the race for Macklin Celebrini right now. So you can say the word pitiful. That's fine. <laughs> uh, how many times are you going to say Macklin Celebrini this season? Until the Penguins are back in a playoff spot. There you go. There you go. But we're going to take one quick break and then we're going to come back and uh, let you know what our biggest surprises have been through the month of October for the Pittsburgh Penguins. We'll be right back. Welcome back to the Tip of the Iceberg podcast, brought to you as always by InsideThePenguins.com. What's so funny over there, Horwat? Sorry, I... <laughs> uh, sidebar i read i read a lot of twitter while we record this episode green day announced a tour and i knew it was gonna uh, be a stadium tour i had no idea where they would go pnc park is where they're coming pnc park shows are fun but they are kind of a pain in the butt <laughs> so can't wait to spend a lot of money to hopefully not stand in the in the audience or sit in uh the blue seats find something on the floor <laughs> I mean, I've never been to a, a concert at PNC Park. All of the ones I've gone to have been at Heinz Field. And yes, it's still Heinz Field to me, damn it. But, of course. you know, I, I feel like it would be obviously cool in the atmosphere with the backdrop. Yes. But that's the same thing you get for any Pirates game. So you're you're saying the uh, the concert experience isn't quite as much? Quite as whenever good. whenever you're sitting in the uh like the actual normal seats that you would for like a pirate game, you're far as hell away from the stage. Uh, yeah. And during season, they don't take the net down. So if you're like uh, behind the net, you're looking through a net now. Uh, oh, yeah. So it's a bit of a pain. It's it is a great atmosphere, uh, but just kind of you're really far away, uh, and that's about it. That's all it is. It's just kind of a, also a lot of people. If you like a lot of people, you got a lot of people. Yeah, fair enough, fair enough. But uh, let's get back to, to Pittsburgh Penguins hockey because it is now the month of November. So, you know, with that, we're going to look back on the month that was in October, the first month of the NHL season, not full month. They started on, what, the 10th was the, the opener against the Chicago Blackhawks, and we're here on November 2nd. So what were the biggest surprises through the month of October? Uh, Horwat, I'll go first since uh, I really didn't talk in the first segment about I didn't give my answer in the first segment, so uh, we'll go with that. My biggest surprise through October, the Ryans, Ryan Graves and Ryan mm -hmm. Shea. And they're both in opposite directions. 
Ryan Graves, I was very high on coming into the season. You, of all people, should know that even before the Penguins had acquired Ryan Graves, I was like, man, it'd be nice if they went out and got Graves because they could use a top-pairing left-handed defenseman since they weren't able to get Jacob Chikrin. So it'd be mm-hmm. nice if they went out and got the top name on the market in Ryan Graves, but I just don't see that happening. Well, lo and behold, they went out, they got Ryan Graves, they signed him to a pretty big deal, and he struggled a little bit to this point. He leads the Penguins in giveaways with nine through nine games. He's actually tied with Sidney Crosby. I'm sure there's a conversation to be had on that. He leads the Penguins in shots blocked. We talked about you know, the amount of shots the Penguins have sent into the shin pads of the opponents. Well, Ryan Graves has 15 on the season, over one per game. And overall, he just looks overwhelmed at points. You know, I've been a little disappointed in the way he's looked, but there are some positive signs with Ryan Graves. He has the highest expected goals percentage of the top four on the defense at 57. He has the least amount of high danger chances allowed at 33 and where he's being deployed. And this is something I got to keep an eye on going forward because I didn't realize it until I looked at the numbers this morning whenever I was getting ready for the show. He is by far the player that is deployed in the worst situations amongst the top four defensemen because everybody else has over a 50% offensive zone start percentage. Ryan Graves is at 37%. Mm -hmm. So starting on his back foot every single time he goes out there, two out of three times that he goes out there to start a shift, he's starting it in his own zone. So I got to keep an eye on that. There are positive signs for Graves, not to mention that I think as the games have gone on, you've seen him get a little bit more comfortable with it. Uh, Chris Letang, and you've seen him start to play a little bit better, a little bit smarter with the puck, a little bit better in his own zone. So you just hope that that continues and maybe takes a little bit more of an accelerated pace considering the position he's playing. But there are positive signs, you know, to look at for him through the first month. I just expected him to be at a at a higher level to start the season than he was. Yeah, I think we all, I think a lot of us did. I, I, we still do like what he's done so far. We're, we are yeah. impressed with his play. Getting off on, you know, starting on your back foot that often, for the most part, means that uh, your coaching staff has faith in you in that position. Like, that's yeah. not an easy spot to be in. They know that um, you won't let offense happen against you, especially in an important situation like that. So the team definitely has faith in him. It's not like they're dropping him or you know, starting to write his downfall anytime soon. He's looked good, maybe just not at the level we had all expected right away. Uh, yeah. The physicality thing I've seen a lot of people discuss, though, from him specifically, considering he was supposed to, with that size, that was the first thing everyone said when they saw him, is that he is a big man, not using the size to his advantage. Mm-hmm. Uh, and maybe that is the biggest aspect that might need to change. Other than that, though, I've been... Fairly, fairly enough impressed with Ryan Graves. Again, it's mm-hmm. you're a defensive defenseman. You're not supposed to be noticed too much. Um, and he really hasn't been for a lot of time, which is good. Yeah. The thing with the physicality, I think, also, is you're not looking for him to be a bruiser. You're not looking for him to be, you know, this might be a bad example. You're not looking for him to be Jacob Truba out there. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, you know absolutely. what you're looking for him to be? You're looking for him to be Brian Dumlin, who was a little bit more physical than what we've seen from Ryan Graves. But that's not that big of a jump for Graves to make. He does have the similar size. He does have the skating ability that Brian Dumoulin had. So all you need to do is have him use it a little bit more. Have him get a little bit more comfortable using that. And that might also go to the fact that this is only nine games where he's Mm -hmm. been given a very important role on this team next to a player that now, yes, I talked about Latang yesterday on Iceberg to Go and how good he's been defensively. But that player at his best in Latang is very, very risky because he Mm -hmm. likes to jump up in the play. I don't think he's done that nearly as much. I think that's partly because they're trying to make sure that Ryan Graves gets his footing underneath them. And they're trying to make sure that that trust is at a level that it needs to be at for Chris Letang to really make the risks that he, he took whenever he was with Brian Dumlin. But as far as the physicality goes, I think that's something that can be taught. That's something that can come through as long as the desire is there. And I feel like the desire is there for, for Ryan Graves to be comfortable. And you talk about, you know, he hasn't been, God awful. He just hasn't been what we expected. And those expectations come when you get a contract the size of the one that Ryan Graves signed for in the offseason. Of course, the expectations are always high. And as for physicality, it also depends on how you define physicality. If you ask Mike Sullivan specifically, physicality is A, winning puck battles, and B, being tough in front of the net. And I think yeah. that is where it'd be, is where the situation sort of sits is that there's not a bunch of toughness in front of the net from, Oh, well, let's start with, with most of these defensemen right now. Most of this team. 
Yeah, they're getting beat in front of the net both in, at both ends of the ice. So yeah, maybe that's where things bleed in a little bit. And that is something yeah. that you can work on. That is something the Penguins have been trying to work on. Their entire last practice on uh, the afternoon of Halloween was there was no power play work. There was no set line combination specifically. Uh, there was a little bit, but it was a lot of net front work, a lot of small rank work, a lot of working in front of the goaltenders, both mm-hmm. on offense and defense. So they're trying to nail that into each other's heads. So yeah, that is something that can be worked on and it's something that they are getting to. Yeah. And I, I won't go too deep on the other one. That's Ryan Shea. Uh, he's on the opposite end of the spectrum. You know, I talked about how Ryan Graves has 37% offensive zone start percentage. The only player that has a lower offensive zone start percentage is Ryan Shea. 33% of his shifts start in the offensive zone, but he's performed really well since taking over for Yo Joseph. You hardly notice him on the ice, which like yep. you mentioned earlier, is a great thing for a defensive defenseman. And here's the, here's the thing about Ryan Shea too. He doesn't play as much ice time as the top four, but he's played a lot with these top four guys. Mm-hmm. You know, Chad Ruedel, 23 minutes of ice time so far at five on five with Chad Ruedel, who is his set defensive partner. Every time the lineups come out, hey, it's, it's Ryan Shea and Chad Ruedel on the third. But Chris Letang, 17 minutes. So only six less minutes that he's playing with Chris Letang than he is with Chad Ruedel yeah. and 11 minutes with Eric Carlson, which is a lot as well. So he's really getting an opportunity with a lot of these defensemen. His underlying numbers look really good, and he's starting in his own zone more than anybody else. I've been very impressed with Ryan Shea, and you had a conversation uh, with a couple people that are pretty close to Ryan Shea, at least one that's pretty close to Ryan Shea, and one uh, player that is actually an analyst for the team. And they were saying in training camp that, hey, look for him to have a pretty good year this year. And all of a sudden, he's looking really impressive through his first. I believe he's played five. I think they made the switch with Joseph and Zahorna in the same game. So he's looked impressive since he uh, he started playing there against the uh, St. Louis Blues when he made his debut about two weeks ago. Yeah, he's looked good. He's looked confident. He's looked like he, he looked, he's looked like he's belonged this entire time. I think that's a big part of it. Um, one of the things that I was told in that conversation was that, you know, he's 26. He is a little bit of an older rookie, right? That's a little bit more aged than what we're seeing from a lot of rookies this year, especially this year, which are like 18, 19 you know, 20-year-old rookie, sometimes you'll get a 21, 22 in there. He's 26. If I'm even getting that age right, I may need to double-check it. But he's still an older rookie in the league. Mm-hmm. Coasted around the uh, with the AHL with the Texas Stars for a couple of seasons. And I was told he's just ha- he's just never been given his – he's never been given his chance. He's never been given that proper push, that proper, hey, you can do it in this league. Here's your opportunity. Mike Sullivan finally gave it to him this year. Helps mm-hmm. they're both Boston boys. Maybe there's a little push there, uh, <laughs> yeah. but it's he's finally getting that opportunity and finally getting that time in the spotlight to show what he's worth. And he's making the most of it and he's performing exactly as advertised. There's not going to be a ton of offense there, but he's going to play a lot of defense. He's going to make a lot of the smart plays. Might make a couple of good passes here and there. <clears throat> we'll see if things can, you know, maybe he'll chip in an assist or a goal here and there. He is definitely. Getting his offensive chances, I think everyone mm-hmm. on this team, because like we mentioned, like this team is pounding shots. In the last two games, they've had 85, I think. They've had over 40. Yeah, 40 plus two. each game. Yeah. Yeah. So they're getting their shots. Everyone is shooting the puck. Cindy Crosby had a career high 12. Look at that for a second. <laughs> yeah, 11. He had 11, actually. They took one away from uh, him. They took one away? Yeah. Man, it was still, still a career high, but 11 shots. It is what it is. It's that's still like, it's like the every penguin on the team is seeing their opportunity of offense. That includes mm-hmm. the defenseman. I mean, every time Marcus Pedersen has it, it seems like he's looking for an open lane to shoot it as well. Monkey see, monkey do with his line mate. Yeah. Um, it's there's a lot of offense coming from everyone in the lineup. So maybe Ryan Shea chips in a goal here and there, but chips in a couple of assists, starts making some plays. This could be a really fun team if certain things start working out. The only place that hasn't had offense is the, th- is the fourth line. Yeah, they, they had their chances against Anaheim. They actually had a couple of good chances against Anaheim. But again, how many times can you say, oh, you had a couple chances, but mm-hmm. you didn't score? Like eventually, especially once you get to 10, 15, 20 games into the season, if that's still the line, then the line needs to be changed. Um, yeah. But Horwat, before we go, uh, what was your biggest surprise of October? I can make mine kind of quick. I would say my biggest okay. surprise has just been uh, in the wrong direction. It's Tristan Jari. Yeah. Uh, 
coming in with that contract, we all praised his play. We all praised his skill level that we know it's there. We know he has some skill. Uh, hopefully, hopefully looking back, it wasn't just us trying to cope for the contract, right? <laughs> it's yeah. Got that new deal. It's worth a lot of money. Well, not a lot of money. It's worth a fair amount of money. Um, and it's a lot of years. Let's, let's say that. Let's say it's a lot of years for what it's worth. Uh, mm -hmm. We, the Penguins need him to perform at that level, perform at that contract level. Two shutouts. Hey, that's great. What's the rest of the season looked like? Oh, ugly. His only two wins have been shutouts. When you hear a play, a goalie has two shutouts through the first nine games. Granted, he hasn't played them all, played in all of them, but let's you know just say through nine games he has two shutouts. You're expecting it, like expecting the team to be maybe, uh, maybe a maybe a complete flip, six and three, six three and zero, oh, maybe six five and one even. At least nope. 500. At least 500 is what you're expecting when your starting goalie has two shutouts through the first month of the season. That's not at all where we're at. That's yeah. not at all what we're looking at. We're looking at Tristan Jari as your only two wins were those two shutouts. What has been happening? Um, that's been my surprise, just in the wrong direction. Uh, and I think we can all agree that that, if this team wants to go anywhere, is what needs to be uh, picked up probably the most. Yeah, goaltending is voodoo, but goaltending is also the most important position on the ice when it comes to factoring into whether or not you win the game. And we talked about it, you know, ad nauseum this week, and we're going to continue to talk about it because until Tristan Jari starts to play a little bit more like the goaltender that he was paid to be, and that goaltender he was paid to be was the two-time All-Star Tristan Jari, yeah. uh, you know, that's, that's going to be a topic of conversation. I don't know, you know, there have been people out that have, thrown out as he injured again he's kind of looking like he was what he's injured i don't think he's injured because when when would he have and if he's injured again then you're in deep trouble because if he got injured already based off of not really being you know hit very much at all when it comes to like on ice collisions you're in you're in you're in deep with that one but i don't think he's injured i just don't think he has confidence and i think you can see that you know whenever you watch the game if he's back in his crease Whenever it's a one-on-one -on -one opportunity, if he's not coming out and getting aggressive with it, then it's it's not a good sign. It's not a good sign. That just means he doesn't have confidence. And this is a goaltender that, you know, confidence is important for all goaltenders, but it seems like it's 10 times as important for Tristan Jari, who when he doesn't have his confidence, when he's not on his game, he could be one of the worst goaltenders in the league. When he's confident and on his game, he's shown to be one of the top 10. You know, there's not really a middle ground there and that's a dangerous position to be in if you're the Pittsburgh Penguins. That's why you need a reliable backup. Can Magnus Helberg be that? I don't know. We'll have to wait and see. But that's going to do it for this episode of the Tip of the Iceberg. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. And remember, you can catch us on every Tuesday and Thursday at the Tip of the Iceberg or you can listen to Iceberg to go on Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Iceberg recap after every single game. We got a lot of content for you. We're going to try to keep ramping it up with more and more content on YouTube at Inside the Penguins or anywhere you get your podcast from. That's it for this one. We'll see you guys next time.